Hello everyone, it's Kiesiel here, and I'll be doing another Fear and Hunger reaction. This one is The Dark Lore Fear and Hunger by Mouth Duke. I hope I pronounced that properly. If I didn't, I apologize. Uh, this was requested by Flying Writer on the Discord. And given what I saw in the animation by Boa Lizard previously, I have a feeling thing, thing, that it's going to be horrifying in a similar way to Berserk. Uh, if, you, if you enjoy watching this with me, I'd appreciate it if you like, comment, and subscribe. Definitely check out the original the original video, a link to which is will be in the description box below. Uh, but without further ado, let's see what this horrifying fantasy world has in store for us. Oh, it looks like RPG Maker. Fear and Hunger is a dark, violent RPG series. And when I say dark, I mean in every sense of the word. It implies and shows scenes of graphic violence, sexual violence, torture, suicide, nudity, child abuse, war, and mental trauma. But players who brave its harsh and unforgiving exterior will find a rich world waiting to be discovered. Crafty and cruel gods, ancient betrayals, political manipulation, and strong heroes cutting through the darkness to claim the ultimate prize. Lore in Fear and Hunger is revealed primarily in two ways. Conversations with characters, some of whom are ancient beings who saw the things we're about to discuss firsthand or through books both ancient and new scattered throughout the places we explore. However, just like our own world, political powers seek to change these stories for their own ends, and you can find rare copies of the books that tell a completely different story than the mass-produced versions. So in the world of Fear and Hunger, there are always two stories. Oh. So then, there's a story that you, that you get told, and then the story really that's actually true. What the majority believe, and what actually happened. There is a real joy in piecing together the story of the world, only to find a single book that completely changes everything. So I'll offer one final warning. If you're like me and enjoy putting the puzzle together yourself, stop watching now and go play the games. The games are definitely worth your time. They're terrifying and brutally punishing, but rich and rewarding for those who can face the trials. For everyone else, let's get into it. When talking about the lore of Fear and Hunger, there's only one place to start, with the gods. There are three kinds of beings known as gods. The old gods, the new gods, and the ascended gods. Their power and influence vary wildly, but all of them are detached and aloof from humanity. Many humans even doubt they exist at all, but their influence is clear to those who know- Build the tower to the gods. That's- Make me both think of the Sword of the Tower of Babel, but also that corpse tower hand thing from when Griffith summoned the god hand with the bail it. Nowhere to look. What exactly the old gods are is a mystery. They wield great and terrible power. By merely existing, they reshape the laws of reality. And being in their presence can transform and distort the body and minds of mere humans. Hmm. They're associated with a strange light called the Green Hue, which itself can send humans mad. Like a pebble thrown into a pond, they leave traces of themselves even after they have long since left our world. By performing certain rituals, one can apparently gain the favour of old gods and be gifted new abilities. Hmm. The first of the old gods we're introduced to are Sylvian, the god of creation, and Grogora, the god of death. Oak. Okay. Hey then. And the two form a pair. There cannot be destruction without creation, and there's no room for creation without destruction making space. Sylvian is said to have created humanity at the dawn of time and loved them dearly. In fact, being the goddess of love, her affection was too much for humans to handle, and there was a period of time when humanity fell into a craze of fleshly delights. A sea of naked people in the middle of coitus who would pulsate and waste their days. The power she blesses humans with can heal, grow magic flowers, and even merge two people together in what's called a Sylvian marriage. 
Sexual acts, such as masturbation or sex, on a Sylvian sigil will bring her favor. This make me think of Slanesh. Grogorov, on the other hand, was the exact opposite of Sylvian. The destruction he brings is widely feared, but it is of a pure kind. It is brought down on everyone equally. Everyone dies, everything ends, and everything decays. He's said to be curious, more than the other old gods, and he wears the skin and bodies of his victims to relive the feeling of fear. The magic he bestows is powerful and deadly. Spells that allow the user to direct their negative feelings of hatred into deadly attacks. Summon a golem made out of their own blood, and even revive the dead in a near mindless state. At some point in time, Sylvian and Grogoroth mated, and the old god Vanushka was born. Vanushka was the god of nature, and embodied both creation and destruction. Makes sense, considering, you know, well, the cycle of nature invol involves was both the creation of life, but also the destruction, such as the case of wildfires that there's a burn away a, the, a, the underbrush and forest to make way for new growth. This guy's temperament was changeable. It could be as wild as a fiery volcano, or as calm as a gentle wind on the grasslands. Vanushka stood in balance to humanity. What is Vanushka's is for men to reap, just as nature reaps man's old and weary. No rites or rituals of Vanushka are shown in game, but the god's power is. Vanushka's spells mirror its demeanor, with healing spells and the ability to grow plants, alongside fearsome pyromancies and ankle-breaking limbs. Little is known about the old god Rur. He's called the Trickster Moon God, and is apparently a god of madness. Or some say, he merely reveals the true nature of things. The moon itself is his body, observing the world below as he drifts quietly. His presence marks the festival of Termina, a three-day bloodbath for every person caught in this moonlight, which is the setting of the second game in the series. Revealing truths to people that thought they can't handle is also so reminding me of, of the whole thing of the, you know, how eldritch entities in the Cthulhu mythos, it was because they're incomprehensible to us, us, them, us, they, if we saw them, we, we'd go mad. For example, like, well, you know, there's a whole thing about Cthulhu and so on having tentacles, but it's like, it's not, if I remember correctly, it's not, they're not really tentacles, it's just that the closest thing in that a human mind can approximate to what they're seeing is a tentacle. The festival is hosted by a servant and spokesman, Pakeli, but as we find out later, he secretly serves another master. Pakeli reveals that Rare has long since left the human world, and despite having strong influence still, all that is left are his traces. At some point in early history, the old gods created humanity. Sylvian asked another being called Vitruvia to design men and women, and Sylvian then went on to use these plans to make humanity real. Vitruvia is likely another old god, but Information on them is very scarce. One more old god present in the games is the god of the depths, who despite being an important character in Fear and Hunger 1, we know little about. Is that just a giant mouse? Its followers include insects, rats, crows, and other vermin. This god is unique in that it is physically present, and you can find its organs spread around the dungeon, although it doesn't speak. Most of these old gods hmm. discussed so far, despite having major influence over the world of fear and hunger, have all vanished by the time of the games. The traces of Grogoroth can be fought in the first game, and there they say that the old gods left because of humanity's unchecked desire to usurp the old gods' power and claim everything for themselves. Long after the old gods created humanity, another god was born. Not quite an old god, but something different. The son of a virgin mother and a false god father, Ormir hmm. was a mortal man who travelled the world with his twelve apostles to unite the people. The corrupt rulers at the time were afraid of his popularity and had him sentenced to death by crucifixion, after which he was resurrected and became the first known ascended god. With his new strength, he united humanity in his worship. Oh. So, 
Kind of like an equivalent of Jesus, I suppose. A worship that remains strong into the current age. Although the political world order he established had weakened greatly even 800 years later. In Termina, we hear a second, slightly different telling of this story. In this version, we hear that it was Vitruvia, the architect who designed humans in the first place, who made Ulmia. After Sylvian began making humans from Vitruvia's designs, Vitruvia began noticing more and more imperfections in them. So she set out to design the perfect human, the pinnacle of man's potential, and created Ulmir. Which one of these stories is true is impossible to say, but perhaps they both are. The rites and rituals of Ulmir are bloody and gruesome. By the way, hey, I've been reading the, in the bits of text as, as, as he goes along, and the idea that the representation of nature as a perfectionist is hilarious, because normally nature does not, uh, you know, does not create perfection. Nature creates good enough. The most common is a ritual of protection. By sacrificing a living person on a spiked crucifix, protection is granted to a town or community for as long as the person stays alive in that position. Ormir is something different from an old god, although what exactly he is wasn't made clear until much, much later. Eight hundred years after the birth of Ulmir, humanity was once again facing untold suffering. By now, the gods had seemingly abandoned humanity, so five people formed the Fellowship, a group designed to seek out the old gods and demand the right of self-governance for mankind. They were Francois, the Dominating, Nilvan, the Endless, Valtiel, the Enlightened, Chambara, the Tormented, and finally, a fifth Forgotten One. The Fellowship travelled to Mahab, Oh, so that so that's who those people in the animation who were all murdered were. City of the gods. But instead of finding the old gods, they instead found the ability to become gods themselves, calling themselves the new gods. One of their party refused to join in godhood and faded in memory as the forgotten one. The new gods emerged from Mahab and tore down the legacy of the old gods and created a new world order in their image or so the official histories would have you believe. In Fear and Hunger 1, we delve deep into the dungeon of Fear and Hunger, which we discover is the trail of the Fellowship and the path to Mahab. Beyond the gates of the City of the Gods, we find many truths to ancient lies. The old gods have indeed long since abandoned humanity, but in the time since, there has been an endless cycle of new gods who rise and fall, the power a pale imitation of the ancient ones. Any human who could face the trial and sit on the throne could ascend to godhood. But for what purpose? An endless series of would be mm. gods sit in the Grand Hall, waiting endlessly for nothing. Eight hundred years after the Fellowship became new gods, their power was fading. Humanity was suffering yet again, and one man was prophesied to unite all people under his banner and bring peace. Once again, the powers that be hated and feared him, and he was imprisoned in the dungeons of fear and hunger. This dungeon was the very same tomb that the Fellowship traversed on the path to Godhood, and its horrors had only increased in the time since. Four heroes entered to find the man imprisoned here, each for their own reasons. This man, Lagarde, was an unstoppable military commander, charismatic, and determined to ascend to Godhood, a true god for humanity. What exactly happened while the heroes were in the dungeon is lost to history. But at the end of everything, two gods were born. Lagarde, obsessed with his own prophecy, attempted to perfect the ritual to become a new god by embodying the aspects of each of his predecessors. Domination, endlessness, enlightenment, and torment. Also, I'm seeing this and I find quite interesting that actually that you can target an en well, the enemies can target individual limbs on your party members and you can do the same to them. Despite everything, however, the inherent process of becoming a new god was flawed, and he failed to become something greater than the others. After some time, Lagarde left the dungeon in a new form. I also makes you wonder, so if someone gets like horribly mutilated and loses limbs in fear and hunger, can they get replacements or are they just kind of uh, stuck like that? 
as the new god known as the Yellow King. But what of the second god? The dungeon served as both a trial for anybody who wanted to enter Mahab, but also as a cradle for a young girl. She, too, was born of a false god and a chosen human, much like how Ulmir was conceived. But she spent her life in darkness and misery. Oh no. Growing in the horrors of the dungeon, the little girl underwent untold suffering, becoming the pure representation of the concepts of fear and hunger, not spoiled by even a glimmer of hope. When the heroes entered the dungeon, several things happened. The girl was rescued, the old god of the depths was slain, and the dark soul within the girl planted its roots and grew from the old god's death. With this, the god of fear and hunger was born, a second ascended god, the second in history after Ormir. This event gives us an important distinction of ascended gods. They're born from a human conceived by a false god, and they ascend using the death of an old god. The birth of this god was orchestrated to kickstart humanity out of its millennia of stagnation. Oh. So the reason that the old gods are gone is un and it's because it's because they've been slain in order in order for for these humans born of false gods to ascend. Fear motivated people, while hunger kept them moving forward. From the hardship, humanity pushed themselves into great technological advancement, eventually leaving the belief in gods and magic behind. Over time, the gods faded into memory, their worship and rituals relegated to backwater towns and churches, and magic faded to the point that most people no longer believed it was even real. The new gods were no longer known as benevolent gods, but instead became known as a kind of mythological secret society, a shadowy group controlling things behind the scenes, which was more true than people realised. With the birth of the god of fear and hunger, the prophecy of Lagarde was forgotten about by the people, but not by him. He became obsessed with bringing about a new god for humanity, one made of humanity's own power and not borrowing the power of the old gods. He manipulated world events behind the curtain for hundreds of years, eventually coming out of the shadows and taking over the Bremen Empire to lead them directly as the Kaiser. Using the rapidly advancing technology of the era, he began constructing a new machine, one to take the information of humans spread out across the world and compile it into a new being, a divine being. It sounds kind of like if someone tried to make a god but just made the internet. <laughs> to usher humanity into a new age. This machine was called Logic. War broke out with the enemy of the Bremen Empire, the Eastern Union, before the Logic project could be completed. The Yellow King, as the Kaiser, expended all wartime effort to reclaim the land the Logic project was built on. The politically unimportant but ancient capital city of the country of Bohemia, called Preheval. The moment his armies recaptured the city, he called for a truce and set to work on logic again. Why was logic built in such an out of the way place and not in the heart of the Bremen Empire? No specific reasons are given. Wait, asterisk? Wait, oh, wait. And I didn't notice until now actually that thing was just floating there. But Preheval held dark secrets of its own. The city was the site of ancient rare worship, the trickster moon god who was thought to be one of the few old gods left. In fact, as the logic project approached completion, the festival of Termina started, marking the presence of rare. As stated earlier, however, rare was no longer with us, and its festival had been hijacked by Pakeli and his new master. Seemingly unbeknownst to all the major players, another secret god was writhing under the surface. Pakeli reveals to the contestant who faces him in Termina that he serves the hidden Sulfur God, a god of pain and suffering, whose cultists inflict the same on others. Elsewhere, we hear that during Ulmir's ascension to godhood, he cast off his hatred and evil into the sulfurous pits, suggesting that this dark god was created as the shadow of Ulmir himself. What Sulfur wants, and where it fits in the hierarchy of gods, is a complete mystery. There are still lots of questions about the lore that we're waiting on answers for. We know that ascended gods require the death of an old god, 
So what god died so Ulmir could ascend? What is the sulfur god? Where does it fit in the pantheon? And what does it want? What is logic? And what is its relation to rare? Is it just another set of shackles humanity has carved for itself? Or are they finally going to be free? The developer, Miro, is still actively updating Tamina and adding new content. So we may get answers to some of these questions yet. The story of fear and hunger is one of humanity trying to push its boundaries, ascend to godhood, and take charge of its own destiny. What does it take for a man to become a god? Are we prepared to face the deepest suffering in order to ascend? And what if the- Was that guy just now saw <clears throat> sawing his own leg off? The cost is greater than we can possibly know. There are a lot of things I didn't go into in this video, um, that's intentional. I wanted this one to serve as a short overview of the setting before we can dive into the really juicy stuff. And trust me, there's a lot going on when you get into it. So make sure to subscribe if you're interested in hearing more about the world of Fear and Hunger. And let me know if there's a specific topic you'd like covered next. Or just let me know what you thought about the video in general. Any feedback helps a lot. I also stream Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, so make sure and come say hi. Uh, thank you again mm. for watching. My name's More They Duke, and I hope to see you again soon. Hmm. Well, that that was a very interesting watch, and I genuinely enjoyed hearing about the lore of this, of the world of fear and hunger, even though it's horrifying and in many ways. And I hope you guys is enjoyed watching with me. You guys should actually definitely check out. Uh, Mouth Doog. I still not sure if I'm pronouncing that properly. But yeah, if you if you enjoy this sort of stuff, you should definitely check him out. Oh, but until next time, thanks for watching. Ta-da!